I uh, uh, want to talk a little bit about uh, introduce uh, Dr. Kurt Luther. Uh, um, I first met Kurt, um, gosh, I guess in 2014, 2015. Um, uh, he's a contributing editor for Military Images, writes a column, Photo Sleuth. Uh, he is also uh, uh, an assistant professor of computer science and, by courtesy, history at Virginia Tech, uh, a great combination of computer science and history. Uh, his research group, uh, the Crowd Intelligence Lab, I'm going to quote here, builds and studies crowdsourcing systems that support creativity and discovery with applications in domains such as journalism, national security, and history. Uh, so his, uh, many of you may simply know him as the uh, founder of Civil War Photo Sleuth, uh, CivilWarPhotoSleuth.com, which is uh, uh, just a, uh, a wonderful intersection of face recognition technology and community to be able to help put names uh, and return names to identif unidentified images. So uh, Kurt is going to uh, update us on uh, what is a fascinating journey in the modern age as we look at these wonderful uh, antique images. So join me in welcoming Kurt. see I've got a slightly dramatic uh, talk title but um, I uh, as Ron mentioned I've been writing this uh, column for Military Images magazine for a while about uh, photo sleuthing and in particular trying to identify uh, photos of unknown American Civil War soldiers and most of the time I'm writing about um, trying to identify photos with no known identification um, but then there's this other group of photos which already have some kind of identification and the question there becomes, what happens when that identification is actually wrong, when it's, when it's not correct? Uh, which I think is sort of a little different category of photo sleuthing um, that I'm gonna talk about a little bit today. Um, and to be fair, sometimes I'm the one that's misidentifying these photos, so uh, I don't claim to be, to be safe in the system. In fact, I'll give an example. Um, but other, other uh, you know, collections you might come across may also have misidentifications, and so this is kind of what I wanna talk about today. Um, so I'll, I'll give a couple examples, uh, which uh, one of which may be familiar from the magazine, one of which will be forthcoming in the uh, next issue of the magazine, uh, about misidentifications. Um, and then I'm going to talk about, uh, as Ron mentioned, my uh, Civil War Photo Sleuth project, but in particular, um, for those who have already heard about this, I'll be mostly talking about a new feature called Second Opinion that's uh, really geared towards trying to help with misidentifications. And then finally, try to end with just some high-level best practices. What should we do to try to get our identifications right or, or, or fix them when they're not uh, correct? So um, start with a, a couple of case studies. One I'll go through pretty quickly, because um, you may be familiar with this example from, from the magazine. But um, a while back, I was trying to identify uh, these gentlemen in this photo here uh, that I got in my collection. Um, no back mark, but uh, clearly a group of union officers. And um, long story short, uh, I was able to do what's called a, a concurrent service timeline. Basically, I was able to identify one of the officers, and then by figuring out when he served in this unit, I was able to kind of uh, rule out possibilities to figure out who the other officers would be who would have been serving in this particular ranks at this particular time in, in history. Uh, and, and so, you know, the more you, the more people you can identify, the more it narrows it down, and then the more people you can identify until you end up with with most of them in this case. So there were um, five of the six that we were able to get some kind of identification and it definitely helped to have a couple of really nice reference um, collections of identified soldiers from the 64th <coughs> Illinois. One was, um, I'll talk a little bit more, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library, uh, their Boys in Blue collection, tons of Illinois images. 
And then uh, Michael Cunningham uh, has a, a wonderful collection of, of uh, 64th Illinois images. So we were able to use those reference images to figure out who most of these folks were. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to this guy um, named uh, Michael Manning, who uh, I identified as being the lieutenant colonel of this regiment uh, in this article. So what could go wrong, right? <laughs> so um, after I published this, uh, I got a nice uh, email from uh, Doug Segrillo, and he is also a collector of Illinois images. And he had another image of a guy who looked a whole lot like um, that Michael Manning fellow, uh, one I had never seen before from his collection. And the interesting thing, uh, so just a you know visual comparison, you can see, oh wow, that looks a whole lot like this guy. Um, now there was a catch, though. Uh, there is a back on this guy, and it's signed Dr. J. T. Stewart, Surgeon, 64th Illinois. Uh-oh. <laughs> so what's going on here? Um, so I think it's fair to say that we've got the same man here. So what's going on with this identification? Um, in fact, uh, the question became, which of these two identifications is correct? Is this somebody actually writing the name of this guy, or maybe they're writing their own name and giving it uh, to somebody else. But uh, Doug did a little more research and he found this nice uh, Physici Physicians and Surgeons of the West book published in 1900, uh, where we see the same guy again labeled uh, James T. Stewart. So this, this is definitely James T. Stewart. So we can, we can now figure out, all right, we know who this is, so what went wrong? How did I get the wrong uh, name here? It's definitely not Michael Manning. So I returned back to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and uh, where I originally got this reference image, and uh, you know, it's, it's labeled Michael Manning. So why is it labeled Michael Manning? I realize I need to ask uh, a little uh, more about this image. So um, looking a little bit further, so the nice thing about this reference collection, they actually scan both sides of the image, and you can see the, um, the label here, Lieutenant Colonel Michael W. Manning, 64th Illinois. Um, this, though, of course, is a modern identification. Right. In fact, there's, um, usually this one actually has a date here. Some bookstore in Galesburg, Illinois from 1969 or 64 or something like that. So uh, maybe that was just incorrect. And so um, this was then used to form the caption of the um, library, uh, Abraham Lincoln Library and then, you know, cascading error back to, back to my original article. Um, the James T. Stewart identification actually works a lot better. Now it helps to explain some other things that I had a little trouble explaining earlier. For example, um, his oak leaf shoulder straps have an MS. That's probably a strong signal of a, of a surgeon, right? Um, he's got the general staff officer buttons. Um, he actually has dark uh, trousers, which are um, typically associated with staff. And, uh, oh, I have an example there. So the pieces start to fit together nicely. But it does raise this, this question of, you know, which sources should we trust? If we come to this, um, this wonderful uh, reference collection, how closely do we need to examine all these, uh, you know, captions or, or metadata or other types of information uh, if we're going to draw upon them to make new identifications? So I left this experience being, uh, you know, um, a little more careful about where I get my information from, right? Uh, so let me bring you to another example. Um, a little more recent. Uh, so some of you may know, so this, uh, there's a wonderful group of images uh, in the Library of Congress, there's about a dozen or 15 of them, that show um, uh, veteran reserve corps uh, regiments that are um, uh, around the Washington Circle uh, Monument, that's, that's George Washington up there. In fact, you can go and check it out. It's only a couple of miles away from here, as many of you may know. Um, this is supposed to be uh, around April 1865, or spring at least, 1865. Um, and uh, what's interesting about this particular image is uh, being a, a glass plate negative, we can zoom in a whole heck of a lot and get some interesting details about who these guys are. Um, in fact, we can zoom in so far, we can actually see this guy's hat brass uh, that is uh, clearly indicating him as a a member of the 9th Infantry, Company H. What's kind of weird, though, is that this particular Library of Congress image is labeled 10th Veteran Reserve Corps rather than 9th. Um, so something doesn't quite make sense here. Uh, there's definitely Veteran Reserve Corps, definitely Company H, but wrong regiment. 
So I dug a little deeper and uh, started looking at the other uh, images from this set. Again, there's about a dozen or 15 of them. Uh, it turns out almost all of them are incorrect. And uh, this is only half, the other half, you, um, I won't actually get too far into the details here. You can read this in the, in the column next, next uh, issue, but uh, the, it's really strange because all these are, some of them are a little bit off, um, some of them are, are like really off. So sometimes it's just the regimen is wrong, you know, company age, but, but it's, it's uh, ninth ERC instead of 10th. Other ones are just, just totally off. Uh, so uh, company C, 10th BRC is actually company D, 9th BRC. Uh, but as soon as you zoom in and start looking at these visual clues, it becomes clear uh, that these labels aren't, aren't quite right. So most of this grouping, these, these 12 or 15 images, are around Washington Circle. They all kind of look the same, as you can see from the, uh, from the row on top. But there was one Veteran Reserve Corps image that uh, was a lot different from the other ones. Uh, these guys are staying in front of this building, um, and as you zoom in, you see, uh, well, first of all, it's an awesome image. Yeah. Uh, but the details don't quite make sense for Veteran Reserve Corps. In fact, uh, a couple of these guys have um, uh, cross cannons uh, insignia on their, on their caps. They also uh, have uh, six core badges. So, you know, at first glance, okay, this doesn't make sense. This, is, this doesn't appear to be, um, uh, what I think it was Company D 10th VRC. Something's not right here. So what is this image? What's going on here? Problem is there's really not enough clues for me to, uh, or at least for me, to really narrow this down. We've got a group of officers. Um, they appear to be heavy artillery or light artillery. They're six core, but there's no regiment numerals. There's no like really distinctive clues uh, that I could see uh, to narrow these guys down. Um, so here is where I thought it might be a good opportunity to use this uh, our Civil War Photo Sleuth software um, that uh, that my group's been working on. Uh, so Ron already gave a nice introduction, but uh, briefly for folks who haven't heard of it, CivilWarPhotoSleuth.com, it's a website um, that I've uh, created with help from Ron, uh, help from Paul Quigley, historian at uh, Virginia Tech, uh, and a great team of researcher, uh, research assistants, my students uh, at Virginia Tech. And uh, it's a free website, you can check it out at CivilWarPhotoSleuth.com. It's, it's grown quite a bit since we last talked a year ago. Uh, we now have over 15,000 registered users. People have actually created accounts for the site. And we have about 30,000 photos of Civil War um, soldiers. About 70% of those are identified. Um, of the 30, about 10,000 actually have come from our users. So these are folks who've actually added images from their own collections, from their, hopefully not attics and basements, but hopefully you know, <laughs> second story rooms, carefully preserved. Um, and these have led to hundreds of new identifications for public and private collections, um, Library of Congress, uh, New York Public Library, lots of, lots of folks. Um, so it does use a combination of uh, face recognition and um, community expertise. Um, in this case, it seemed like it would, it's kind of my last resort, trying to figure out who these guys are. And uh, when I use this site, um, right now the site uh, requires you to pick which person you want to uh, investigate. Uh, it doesn't do group photos yet. So I was looking through this image, and I'm trying to figure out which ones I want to start with. And my approach is usually to start with the guys who are usually either the highest ranked um, or the most distinctive or, or both. Right higher rank, more likely to have reference image available in some collection. Um, more distinctive, more clear when you find a match, as opposed to you know generic 18-year-old Union private, clean-shaven, sure, kind of looks like him, you know, you'll never be able to say for sure. So I, I figured, all right, let's start with the field officer, that's the obvious choice. He's got a pretty distinctive look. Um, and then uh, I ran him through our Civil War Photo Sleuth database. I didn't come up with any results, nothing that was that was um, convincing. So I just kind of went down the line. This next guy, um, the captain, has also got a pretty distinctive face. He's got these wonderful ears, uh, <laughs> nice mustache. Um, and uh, no luck with him either, unfortunately. Next on the list, uh, this guy, also pretty distinctive looking, kind of a youthful, baby-faced, I guess you could say, lieutenant. Um, didn't get any matches, anything that was really close for him either. So I was pretty bummed at this point, not getting much luck here, right, so far. Um, last but not least, I figured I'd try this guy, the, the, the Ryan Gosling lookalike, I guess you could say. <laughs> I don't know, I, maybe you don't see it, but um, he's, got, uh, he's got a core badge, he's got uh, um, uh, cross cannons, uh, and he's a, he's a lieutenant. 
what was cool was, as I ran him through the database, I got a pretty good match um, right off the bat as a, a kind of a top result. So the way the site works is it, it gives you a bunch of search results and it sorts them by the most sim similar in terms of facial appearance. Um, originally, I was narrowing it down to just looking at um, artillery lieutenants, Union artillery lieutenants. And so just show me those guys that look similar. And he came up as the top result and I said, oh, well, that's, that's, a, that's a good sign. That looks promising. But, you know, maybe it's not him. What if I look at the entire database and I don't filter by anything, just, just compare them to every Union soldier in the database, which is like 21,000 some soldiers, he still came up as the top result. Mm. So, all right, this is getting a little more promising. The odds of that happening are pretty low, but definitely not good enough to um, say for sure. Uh, so we need to look a little bit further. Here's a reference image, by the way, from the New York State Military Museum. Um, I like the way he's got the, the core badge kind of cocked on both of them. That seems like a fun little detail, but again, you don't want to get too confident, right? So I look up his service history. Uh, his name's Robert Finley. Um, he's a lieutenant uh, in the, um, well, he's in two units, 9th and 2nd New York Heavy Artillery. Uh, there's an interesting story there where the, um, the uh, members of the 9th, uh, who joined a little bit later, their, their companies were actually transferred to the to the second when the ninth mustered out. So some of these guys got to serve a little bit longer. Um, this image uh, is a really great starting point, but I wanted to see if I could find any images of other folks uh, in the unit. So maybe I could find some other matches from the group shot. Uh, and here's where I get lucky again, because the, um, the uh, uh, ninth New York Heavy Artillery has a wonderful regimental history with more photographs of officers in that unit than you would ever find in most, so it's a wonderful reference. Um, it was published in 1899, and thankfully, archive.org has a digitized copy. Look at this, like you get these wonderful <coughs> like collages of all the officers, everyone's labeled uh, conveniently and everything like that. So um, I went through this book, and I'm trying to find anything that might look like a match for any of these guys. And uh, if I can find more than one, then that really helps solidify the idea that this could be Robert Finley, right? So these are the folks we're trying to figure out. There's Robert. He's um, actually not in the regimental history. They, that was the one guy they couldn't find a photograph of. Um, but luckily, he's, he's pretty reliably ID in the, um, in, the, in the museum. How about the other guys? So uh, I was happy to find that um, every single one of these other three guys had uh, a good match in a CDV that was in the published regimental history. Um, this guy in particular, we'll get back to a little bit later. Um, now, uh, the fun thing is, why didn't I find any of those three guys when I first did the facial recognition search? The answer is I didn't have reference images of any of these three guys in my database. I only had Robert Finley. So it's two pieces of the puzzle, right? My website only had Robert Finley, and um, the regimental history didn't have Robert Finley, but it did have the other three. So together, we were able to see, okay, here's matches for, for four different guys in the same view. Um, but it got a little bit easier when I just turned a few pages. <laughs> I found the same exact thing in there. Right? Just read the book, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so this is a good match, uh, of course. Um, and there's some really good details in here. Uh, some really interesting stuff. So this building is actually identified wow. specifically as the headquarters of what they call the 9th Battalion. So the 9th Battalion was that group of companies that uh, got transferred from the 9th to the 2nd. And, and so they, I guess they decided to all sit in front of this building, you know, as the, the folks, the kind of uh, the crossover folks, and, and get photographed with their major, who was that um, uh, Sullivan guy. Uh, he was um, the, in charge of that particular battalion. It was a huge regiment, so they had like three majors. And it's at 4 C.F. Smith. Um, so now that I know that this is the second uh, heavy artillery, New York heavy artillery, and I know this is at Fort C.F. Smith, I got new search terms to look for, right? So I can look for other images uh, that might be uh, useful for figuring out how these guys are. And um, there turns out to be another one, the Library of Congress. Uh, on the right here, this is labeled uh, New York, second New York heavy artillery. Um, and it's at Fort C.F. Smith. So we got this weird thing going on here where we've got two images of the same building but two totally different captions. Um, Company D, 10th U.S. Veteran Reserve Corps, and 2nd uh, New York Heavy Artillery, 
So are this, is it the same guys in front of the building or what's going on here? Um, so I'm gonna fix that one real quick. <laughs> right, but, but they have different photog photographers, they have different dates. So what's up with these guys? Um, well, pretty quick, you can look at the second image and see some familiar faces, right? Um, so now that we know who this guy, uh, this um, Lendl Bigelow, Captain Lendl Bigelow fellow is, uh, it's pretty clear um, that he and his, his companion, uh, Wheeler, made the transition to the second uh, unit, and they're still sitting in front of this building, but apparently a little bit later. And Lendl has a, has a new uniform, but he still misses his old regiment because he has this cool core badge where there's actually a nine in the core badge for the 9th New York Heavy Artillery. So he's like, you know, hearkening back to the good old days. And once you get this guy's familiar face in your head, you start to see him all over the place. All over these uh, photographs of Fort C.F. Smith. He's, he's like everywhere. And there he is again, monitoring all of this stuff going on. So, so what's fun is I'm not sure anyone ever knew this guy's name before, but now we have the name of, this, of the guy with the great hat. Um, so in the um, last few minutes, I want to talk about uh, some software that we've been working on with the Civil War Photo Sleuth site that kind of helps us with these misidentifications, or at least that's the hope, um, going beyond what I, what I was just showing you. And the, the kind of um, cornerstone of this is the fact that the face recognition itself isn't perfect. So this is something that I have to talk, uh, I have to explain to folks a lot, because uh, oftentimes they're hoping that the computer can kind of um, give an automatic yes or no answer when, you know, is this photo, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln or, or Jefferson Davis or something like that. So we did a test with um, Union officers, Union enlisted, Confederate officers, Confederate enlisted, African American Union soldiers, uh, and just tried to see how well the face recognition did. And so you can see like the green boxes are the correct matches, uh, and this is the ranking. So these two out of five cases, the first ranked face was actually not the correct match. So this guy, um, the fifth ranked face was actually the correct match. For this guy, the third ranked face was actually the correct match. So right off the bat, you know that this isn't quite good enough, right? It's not um, perfectly accurate. And um, even if they're the correct matches, they don't always score highly. So like um, in this case, for example, this is a, a score out of zero to one. This is the confidence that the computer has. And it's saying there's a 0.6 confidence out of one that this is the right guy. Um, that's pretty low, right? 60% confidence, not that great. But also, not only is it low, but it's very similar to all the other scores. So the, it ranges from like 0.59 to 0.61 and encompasses like totally different and incorrect photos. So clearly this isn't good enough, right? We need to, we need to supplement this with, with human expertise. And that's what I always emphasize. Well, for one thing, the face recognition is not looking at anything beyond the face. It's not looking at hairstyle. It's not looking at ear shape, which a lot of people think is as distinctive as a, as a fingerprint or as facial features. It's not looking really at scarring or, um, or skin imperfections or tattoos or, or color in a lot of cases. So those are all things that humans can really supplement and complement what the computer is doing. Um, and so when we put this website uh, up and uh, folks started using it, uh, we, no, not surprised, people started to get some, some results that they were trying to figure out if they were correct or not. And so on social media, Facebook and other groups, people would be posting these potential matches and saying, well, is this the right guy or not? You know, they can't be completely sure. It's a different image of the same guy. Um, they were asking for second opinions from the broader community. So we're trying to figure out if we could help people do this, to get the second opinions, and in particular, trying to help people notice those details that might clearly indicate that it's not the same guy or it's likely to be the same guy. Um, we basically want to help people overcome their confirmation bias, right? You have two photos, you really do want them to be the same because you want that identification. That's going to make it way more interesting, maybe way more valuable, um, and we don't want people jumping to false conclusions. So um, we drew a little bit on psychology to help us figure out how to design this system. Um, there's some nice psychology work uh, on differences and similarities. One of them is called alignable differences. It's basically the idea that it's easier to compare two things that are pretty similar than it is to compare two totally different things. It's easy to compare two trucks. It's hard to compare a truck to a boat, right? Where do you even start? So we're trying to bring together similar images to make comparisons easier. 
The other idea we got from psychology is called high diagnostic features. And this is basically like very unique features that either make it very clear it's the same guy or very clear it's not the same guy. So if there's like a, a distinctive mole or scar or just very unusual nose or something like that, then if the other match has that, that really helps, right? If it doesn't have that, okay, it's definitely not the same guy, right? So those high diagnostic features are really useful. That's what we were trying to emphasize um, in this system. So we ended up creating uh, a site, uh, an add-on to the site called Second Opinion that helps people kind of define these features. Um, it's got these three phases. You see the image with the um, high diagnostic features, then you ask for help from the crowd, aka other people that are out there online willing to help you, and then you analyze the results. Um, so this is how it would work. Uh, the expert or user, you know, whoever it is that's trying to identify this image, first thing they do is they're gonna look at this image and they're gonna try to um, find some high diagnostic features, things that really make this guy stand out. So for example, maybe we think that he's got um, a really unique forehead, it's really high. So we're gonna call that high forehead a high diagnostic feature. If someone doesn't have that forehead, we're gonna rule them out. Um, it's definitely not gonna be him. If they do, then that's gonna help narrow down the possibilities. Um, then we send that out to lots of other people who kind of look at these two images, each one from that short list, and they decide whether it's the same guy or not by going through a bunch of more specific categories. Do they have the same facial hair? Do they have the same hair? Do they have the same eyes, etc.? cetera? Um, and the idea is this happens really quickly. We actually set this up to happen almost in real time, with the idea being that if you're in, a, in an antique shop or, or you're at an auction or something and you need to make a decision quickly, you can get these opinions really fast. So you go through facial hair, you say, all right, it, it's not the same facial hair, here's what they have in common. Uh, they both have mustaches. Um, the guy on the left has mutton chops, good times, right? Um, and then uh, we also want to see the unique features. So the high forehead, maybe the curved eyebrows, those high diagnostic features that most people aren't likely to have. That's this part here. And then finally, they make an overall guess. Uh, yeah, I think it's the same guy. No, I don't. Anywhere from definitely no to definitely yes. So as the person who started this investigation, you get this feedback from these six people and, um, whoops, too fast. And you get to see um, more greens means more people in agreement that this is the same match, the same person. Um, more reds or more yellows indicate more doubt, less, uh, less certainty from those folks. If you wanna zoom in on any particular person like this guy, and you wanna see what people said exactly, then there's this detailed view. So for the eyebrow, four out of six people thought the eyebrow wasn't a match. For the forehead, three out of six people thought it wasn't a match. Then you can go through each of these features more specifically. For the facial hair, what do you mean three out of six people thought it wasn't a match? Well, here I can see that um, uh, folks thought, thought the guy on the left had mutton chops and a mustache, but the guy on the right had a full face beard, so different kind of facial hair. Then finally, of course, you get the overall judgment. Is this the same person or not? So we're curious to see what people would do with this kind of system, if they would actually find value from it, if they would actually want to use it, and how accurate it would actually be with these crowd users be able to provide high quality feedback. Um, so we ran through a bunch of different images. We had 10 different PhotoSleuth experts try this out, folks who've been in the community for a long time and have um, tried to identify lots of different photos. Here's what we saw. So um, we're looking at two kinds of things. If people saw a correct match, did they say it was correct? And if they saw an incorrect one, did they say it was incorrect? So first, let's talk about what one person would say. Um, for correct matches, if you asked one person, they would get a correct match correct 80% of the time, 87% of the time. An incorrect person, so they, they're saying, nope, that's the wrong guy, they were correct only 38% of the time. So this individual worker tends to be bad at ruling out wrong matches. They tend to see lots more matches than there are. Now, what if we ask six workers to do each one and then kind of aggregate those together? Well, they turn out to be better at the correct matches. We go from 87% to 100%. If you get the overall majority, they tend to kind of um, balance out and get a much better result. But it's the incorrect matches, it's the false positives where the aggregator or um, crowd does a lot better. 
So we go from 38% accuracy to 75% accuracy. You get those six people to look at this image and decide that it's not a match, those they do way better than just having one person do the same task. So there's, there's a wisdom of crowd effect going on here, you could say. Um, now that's how well the crowd did on the performance. We're interested also, of course, in what the expert thinks. You know, are they actually gonna use this thing? Are they actually getting value out of it? So we saw a few different responses. Um, one was they thought it kind of helped them build confidence by being more systematic in the way that they compared these possible matches. So they would say, um, uh, you know, it gave me more confidence, it forced me to rule out some people in a more systematic way instead of just saying, I don't think it looks like that person. It helped uh, some of these experts notice things that they would have missed originally. Um, so this, this uh, expert says it kind of forces you to re-examine some of your assumptions. And then finally, it kind of provided a more organized way to look at the feedback um, than what they would get in outside sources like Facebook. Um, and this expert is talking about on Facebook, you could ask for a second opinion, get some comments, but it's very difficult to kind of keep them organized and, and, and see what people have talked about and never find that stuff again. So it seems like this could be useful. Um, moving forward, we're trying to integrate this into the main website. Uh, tomorrow at the show, you'll be able to check it out yourself and see uh, you know, what you think about this and if this is something you might want to use. Um, and so eventually, all these uh, identifications that have, we have on the site, we want people to be able to provide a more nuanced um, opinion about what they're seeing. Is this definitely the same guy, definitely not the same guy, um, or something in between? So kind of taking advantage of that wisdom of the crowd, hopefully. Um, so finally, uh, this is going to be pretty short because I just have one slide on it, but I wanted to sum up some of these ideas and kind of suggest some best practices for preventing misidentifications or correcting them if you find them. Um, and this is kind of stuff I've already suggested. So first, question those assumptions. Just because it's in that um, re uh, reliable public uh, database or uh, you, know, you feel you really trust this uh, collector or dealer that's telling you what it is, or it's what the eBay listing says, of course you need to question those assumptions, right? The cool thing about photos is you never have to take anybody's word for it. If, if someone is claiming this photo has a particular ID, then there has to be evidence. There has to be either an inscription or a, an identified reference image that you can easily compare it to. There's no reason to just believe an identification because somebody claims it. Now if they claim it, that's a great starting point. That allows you to do some research and figure out if it's correct or not. But it's kind of like Wikipedia, right? Anybody can edit Wikipedia. Uh, so you don't really trust it, but it's still a useful place to start if you're going to start doing some research on a topic. Um, hey, it's valuable to seek those second opinions. Hopefully the site that we're creating will make it uh, easier to do that, and especially to kind of help people notice problems that they're not necessarily able to notice themselves because of that confirmation bias, that desire to really get those matches. I think it's valuable to indicate confidence levels when you make these identifications. You know, not just saying this is uh, this is a match, but how sure are you? Are you saying this is possibly the same guy? Are you saying it's probably the same guy? Are you saying it's definitely the same guy? Um, I'm trying to figure out the right language for that myself as we create this feature on the website. What are those scales? How do people talk about this? I'm curious, maybe appraisers talk about this in a certain way, um, and there's professional ways of doing this that maybe uh, we can build on. Um, and. Finally, uh, and this is advice I'm trying to take myself, admit when I'm wrong, right? And tell people when you're wrong so that they can build where you left off and hopefully get things straight again. Um, it's very difficult to get wrong information off the internet once it's up there, but at least you can make the effort to try to clarify what you found and that could help other folks too. Um, I guess the final thing I would suggest that I didn't really put on the slide because I think it's maybe, um, maybe it's obvious, but I think it's so important is try to help other folks out with their identifications. And that includes these public collections who in my experience have been super receptive to getting feedback and, and uh, corrections uh, to improve their collections. And I know that lots of private collectors feel the same way. So I hope everyone will be generous and uh, willing to help so that we can all kind of make more of these misidentifications uh, correct and be what they should be. Uh, so with that, I will say thanks and I'm really excited to take questions. Sir? Your next to the last slide will not work in Washington, D.C. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, we, we can start it here, you know? We'll, we'll create a movement, and, and starting in this room. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Um, my wife and I have cataloged all the 80 known images of Pauline Cushman, who was a spy and a Civil War sure. actress. I posted three of them on your website that I know are her taken within three years of each other. No matches. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, I mean, I have 80 different pictures I could just post on there to see how many are. Uh -huh. And there's ones on the fringe, but so far, based on my one little test, I'm not that, my confidence level isn't as, as high. Sure. Just, yeah, that's that's really good information. So I'll, maybe I'll get back with you on that one. So, so the, the results definitely vary, and in fact, uh, Pauline is a good example because um, we have far fewer images of women, as you might expect, than we do of men. And and that goes, uh, I guess you could say the the database has got the most images of Union officers from Northeast regiments, and it's got very few images of comparatively very few images of, of Confederates, of African American soldiers and of um, women, uh, civilian women and nurses. And two of the images were her dressed as a field officer. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> I'll the, get back with you. The, yeah, so basically the idea is that these images, uh, the, the database and the technology gets better the more images you have, the more reference images that you have. Uh, so it's, uh, I can encourage you to add all the other 80 oh. that remain, <laughs> and then you'll actually have better results, right. and probably other people coming down the pipeline will also have better results. Let's take one more question. Sure. I kind of have two questions. One, have you contacted the Library of Congress about updating that information because we like to talk to be accurate? Say again? We like our peacock, our printed photograph online to oh. be accurate. So I'm happy to facilitate that if you can. <laughs> Thank you. That would be great. Um, I have not, um, but I'm just waiting on our article to, to come out, which I think it's coming out in, in a couple weeks. Then I'll have something I can actually share. Um, with those folks, but I, I would love any help to kind of get in, in front of the right people. Thank you. And also, I'm going through this right now with Robert Greenway's Daguerreotypes, where I have a few sitters that I think are certain people, yeah. and I have other photographs of them, only my problem is 1840 is not a you know, positive time to have other portraits to compare to, but do you right. ever do this kind of uh, that's a great question. So our site, we interpret Civil War kind of broadly. So we take that to mean images from the Civil War era, 1840 to 1870, as well as images earlier and later that involve Civil War veterans. Uh, so it could fall within that category already. Um, if not, uh, we could imagine kind of in the future, enhancing where we're going beyond the Civil War era to other periods. I've gotten interesting requests from folks like uh, interested in identifying images from the World War II era, uh, from even the Vietnam War era, and uh, the technology itself seems like it should be able to handle other time periods, but we actually haven't gone to the point where we can set it up for other things yet. But it's something I've been uh, getting interesting inquiries about, and hopefully we can think about in the future. What if I gave you like three images of people I thought were the same, and you threw them in your database, would it pull those? So that's something you can try. Yeah, you can definitely try that. In fact, I'll be happy to, to show you how it works. Okay. Um, and and I encourage other folks to do the same. You know, the more people that add images, the more rich the, the resource gets for everybody. And on that note, thank you so much. Kurt's going to be around tomorrow, so uh, uh, Jeremy and others, we can uh, grab your questions then.